All right, Revelation 21 begins a new cycle, if you will, uh, of a vision. Um, probably 1 through 7 are some of the best known verses in Revelation. Are we... The beauty that we see both in 21 and 22 is what helps to motivate us to pull us in a positive way toward a home in heaven as it gives that description about what it will be like. And as we go through here, of course, as the whole book has been, it, there are signs and symbols. We don't want to fall into the trap of thinking that there is a literal street of gold or there are literal gems and jewels and things like that that make up heaven because heaven is not a physical realm it is a spiritual realm but it has to be put in terms with which we are familiar things that would help us to get a grasp of what it's like and it's simply conveying to us that overall idea of the beauty of heaven. So let's look at Revelation 21. Let's read 1 through... Let's go ahead and do just 1 through 7 to start with. Who will grab that for us? Paul. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth from the first heaven and the first earth had packed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I saw John. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down of heaven, coming down of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from the eye, from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying, and shall, there shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. And he who saw sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who serves. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Okay. So giving us this great picture of how God and man enter into full and complete fellowship with one another. And as he talks there about the new heaven and the new earth, how do you understand that? Is he, or maybe how do even people around us uh, certain religions understand that. Well, certain religions believe that there's going to be a change in the present birth and that it's going to take on a new form, if you will. And there will be that this dwelling place for people beyond earth. Right, right. Anybody want to expound on that? The rapture will come. People will be raptured. Okay. There's quite an extensive doctrine surrounding all this. Yeah, yeah, there, there's one side that is like a premillennial side, and they have a particular view. And Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh day Adventists have a view that there's going to be a regeneration of the earth, and the entire earth is going to return and be like the Garden of Eden. And that's where, I don't know if you've seen. Jehovah's Witness material, but in there, you know, they'll they'll have children playing and having fun, and, and people um, 
you know, out maybe tending to crops or something, and then they'll have a wolf, and they'll have a lamb, and they'll have a lion, and all those things out there, they, their idea is that we're just going to live, or at least other than the 144,000, we will live on a regenerated, perfect earth forever and ever because they say that's what God originally intended with the garden and that's what He's going to reestablish with the new heavens and the new earth. Well, I guess I'd have to ask, can regeneration happen from something that is totally destroyed? <laughs> well, see, that's another debate that... that regeneration yeah. has to come from a remnant of what existed. Exactly. Um, so just take a quick little side note. You, you know, along with that belief, they think when you die that you go into non-existence. And so I asked them about that and, I, and, and about this regeneration and how these people will live again on earth. They said, well, they're in God's memory. It's almost like they have an idea of God downloaded a file of their life, their personality, all that stuff into his mind, and then he's going to re-upload it in some regenerated body here on earth, which it, it's, it's convoluted, okay? It just, it does not square up with Scripture. But we want to notice that when he talks about a new heaven and a new earth, again, this is symbolic language. He's not talking about a literal universe. He's not talking about a literal earth, you know, dirt and trees and rocks and water and all that kind of stuff because by the way it also says there's no more sea. So I guess if you carry it out to his conclusion, the re regenerated earth won't have any seas on it, which anyway. Um, so new here, this word new is a, a specific word in the original language and it means new in kind. Not just like renewed, right? Not like refreshed or something like that. But it's new in kind. It's different. And again, he's putting this in language that you and I can understand. When he talks about heaven and earth, he's talking about the realm in which we know of our existence. That, that's how we experience life. We're here on earth. We look up. We see the heavens. That, that's where we are. And he's just saying we're going to have a new existence or a new realm in which we will dwell. And we will dwell, of course, as he talks about, in the presence of God. Now he says here that there's not going to be a sea. Any ideas on what he's talking about that the sea is gone? You remember sea being mentioned earlier in the book? Multiple times. <clears throat> In Revelation, go ahead. Would that not be the nations of people uh, that you referred to earlier, you know, referring to the sea? Okay, there, there is this picture of the sea in the book of nations, peoples, and remember the beast of the sea rose up out of that sea, and one of the ideas is this could be a reference to there. there's no more of that evil society, that wickedness that would give rise to a beast of the sea, that all that's done, that, that nations that existed on earth can't exist anymore because there is no more earth. Um, something along those lines. So that's definitely one of those things that's seen here. Uh, there's also in Revelation 4 verse 6, he talks about the sea that surrounds the throne like clear crystal, like glass. And that is pictured as a sea of separation between God and His creatures, God and His creation. And now that's collapsed and there's no more separation between God and His people. Now, I'll leave it to you to, to decide which one exactly that is. Um, I think either one biblically fits within the book and within the rest of the New Testament. But be that as it may, it says this, there's the new heavens, the new earth, there's no longer any sea that exists there. Um, and it talks about in verse 2 that it's this holy city of Jerusalem that is coming down. When you think of holy city of Jerusalem, a new Jerusalem specifically, what comes to mind? Why would he 
describe it in this way. First of all, holy being what? What does holiness indicate throughout the Bible? Clint. different than the rest. Right, right, exactly right. So th this is something that is pure, acceptable, sep separated unto God. But he talks about the New Jerusalem. Why would he talk about a New Jerusalem? I mean, Philip. In the Old Testament, Jerusalem was where he decided to, to basically indwell with the people of Israel. That was where his house was. So that's where God was. So in the New Jerusalem, with the, with the saints, I mean, God will dwell in that New Jerusalem. Right, exactly right. That deep history in the Old Testament, even before they went into Canaan land, he said, I'm going to pick a city where I will be, where I will dwell among my people. That came to be during David's reign when he took over Salem, uh, you know, the city of the Jebusites there, and it was named Jerusalem. They end up building the tabernacle or building the temple there. God dwelt among his people there. That's where his name was. That's where they were to turn and to pray to. Uh, so that new Jerusalem is carrying that concept of here is where God dwells. Yeah, we I mean, can also look at uh, where Melchizedek came from. He actually came to Jerusalem, which was the city of peace, is what the Jerusalem means. And you know, when we read the book of uh, Hebrews, it talks about. Uh, okay, yeah, let's go there. Yeah, let's go to Hebrews 11. Exactly. That's exactly where I wanted to go, Mike. And if you would, uh, read Hebrews 11.10 and then jump down and read 13 to 16 for us. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they'd been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. Okay. These pilgrims, Abraham, Sarah, Noah, all the others that he lists in here, they look for this city, and you have something to expound on on that, Mike? Well, you know, just the fact that, you know, when you go through, and even in the book of Hebrews, when it's talking about Melchizedek and that order of, of Melchizedek and that priesthood and how Christ's priesthood is like that, it came out of Jerusalem, now this is the new Jerusalem, all of this starts to really kind of tie together all the way from the very beginning of Genesis all the way to the end of the Right, right. It's exactly right. And the it, it describes it here in Hebrews 11 as a city whose architect, whose builder is God, who, who made that foundation, who created that city. In the book of Revelation, it, it talks about it again. Um, and it says that these individuals, they set their mind on going there because they desired that new city, that heavenly country, as it's also described. Um, it's, let's do our best to set aside politics. What is happening at our southern border? What's in the news reports, anybody? Okay, there isn't a border, but what's actually happening? Why? Why are they leaving South America, Central America, Mexico? Why are they leaving those places? They're looking for a better place. They're looking for a better place. The United States, okay, set aside all the stuff that we can see in the media and all that. The United States is still the beacon of hope for the world. As they look, there's freedom. There's economic opportunity. That's where we want to go. So many people. And you look at that journey that they take to get here and how they will sacrifice. Some of them will even send their children. 
And there's various things that we could break down and analyze from a political perspective and national sovereignty and all that. I want to just set that aside. Why are people doing that? Why have they done it for over 200 years? They're like, we want to go to the United States because it was a desirable place to be and people sacrificed tremendously to be able to get here. Now think about how he's describing this heavenly city, this new Jerusalem in the book of Revelation and what type of existence there is there. That, that ought to be within us a burning desire. I want to be there just like Abraham and Sarah and others. I want to go there. That's my destination. Now I'm not going to look back because I know what's behind me. Those conditions were terrible, miserable. I don't want to be there anymore. I want to press forward to that heavenly city. Clint, do you have something to add? Yeah, the church in Philadelphia was told about this new Jerusalem as well. Uh, chapter 3, verse 12. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven in my own new name. And so... He's simply encouraging the church here, keep doing what you You haven't denied my name. You know, I'm going to keep you from this uh, trouble that's coming because you've done well. And so you know, he's, he's already pointing them to the reward, which is that new Jerusalem. Right. Any other thoughts? Mike. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, here in Hebrews, whenever it makes mention that, have they even thought about going back? And way to get back to where they were would have been open to them. But whenever they were so laser focused on what lay ahead of them that even Satan himself knew there's nothing I can do to even entice them to go back. So he had to put up different roadblocks and stuff like that in the way. But it was never an idea of they ever wanted to go back from where they came from. Um, and we never read of any of that. The nation of Israel at the very beginning, they talked about Egypt wanting to go back there and all that kind of stuff. And um, but we never read that of this honorable faithful they were looking straight ahead. Right, right. These great men and women of faith were absolutely determined in that. I was gonna say, Stephen, in the comparative that you have given to us and what we see here in this new heaven and the new earth, there are rightful heirs and it is a conditional entry. And so is the case. We see that and understand the nations of the world, don't we? Yes. Why can't we understand when God has set forth those before us? Right, right. Exactly right. There were conditions, and, and he had just finished that, as a matter of fact, in chapter 20, talking about those who had their names written in the book of life. They are the ones who are in the end. They are the ones who have the right, the privilege, to be able to go in and to participate and be a part of this new Jerusalem. Now, he says in verse 3 that the tabernacle of God is with men. And that's just pointing to that idea that God is now dwelling with men, that men are in His immediate presence and having that fellowship with Him. I asked you in question 1, what practical application does 21 verse 4 have for you? Um, I gave an example, but what... What kinds of things? You know, when he says, look, there's not going to be any tears. God will wipe away every tear. No more death. No sorrow. No crying. No pain. All those things are gone. Anybody want to share a practical application for you? What you're looking forward to? Well, in the Garden of Eden, uh, it said that God walked with it. Adam and Eve Adam and Eve in the garden. So his fellowship with us, if he fellowship with us, it has to be pure and holy. And this crystal sea is the innocence, the pure, without sin. Yeah, we'll be before him without sin. Yeah. Anybody have a specific thing that you're looking forward to that's not going to be here anymore? I look at it as there's a lot of innocent people who are affected by sin today because of consequences. And so, let's say, you know, the drunk driver. He gets a family and children die. That won't be here. That doesn't exist anymore. 
Mm -hmm. and, and that, that to me is super comforting. That there's just no more consequence of sin, regardless of innocent or guilty. It's gone. Yeah, sin is gone, so there's no consequence with it. The war with Satan is over. Mm -hmm. His deception is ended. The continuation of souls being deceived and lost has come to an end. And that great conflict from the beginning, when Satan appeared in the garden, is now over. And, and the horrific loss of souls. Right. Ended. The That big overarching blessing is going to be there's no temptation therefore there's no sin therefore there's no consequence of sin everything from guilt to practical everyday pain and suffering that comes from sin so all of that's going to be gone anybody have anything else no more waiting for Christ's return okay no more waiting for his return here. Any other thoughts? See, I thought you'd say something like, I'm not going to have any arthritis, I'm not going to, you know, cry over difficulties, struggles, pains. Alright, very good. Uh, verses 5 and 6 says, all things will be made new. Write these words because they're true and faithful. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the fountain of the water of life. Is offered to who? To all who thirst. You all have a desire that are seeking it, as he has from the very beginning. You know, we have a free will. Do we exercise our will to serve God or to serve self? Right. Uh, Jesus talked about it, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Here he's saying, this is yours. You thirst for it. You want it. You can have it. He's offering that to us. Um, all right, anything down through verse 7? All right, let's read verse 8. We'll grab verse 8 for us. Go ahead, Chris. But the cowardly and unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, <coughs> excuse me, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, Liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Okay, so what's the condition of these people? Sin. It's sin, but eternally lost. Eternally lost. Suffer the second death, the separation, going to the lake of fire that was prepared for Satan. And his angels. Right. It was not God's intent that man should go there. Right. How does Jesus describe it? Does anybody remember in Mark 9? He said, it, you know, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. Because why? Well, to be cast into hell, where there, or cast into outer darkness, where there will be what? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why is there weeping and gnashing of teeth? Okay, pain and suffering. Okay, he just said, look, in this new Jerusalem, there's no sorrow, there's no pain, there's no death. In contrast to that, where these go to that lake of fire, there's going to be sorrow, there's going to be pain, unending, ceaseless. Have probably a lot of regret also. And whereas you get to New Jerusalem, there'll be zero regret. Exactly, exactly right. So, and the sad reality is the majority of humanity is headed to this lake of fire. You go back through biblical history, and it has always been true the majority of people reject God. There's only a few that will serve Him and honor Him. Clint, then Zach. New Jerusalem is with God. God is with the New Jerusalem. He is not with the Lake of Fire. He's absent. Right. He will never be. And that's why they're in that outer darkness. God's presence is not there. His favor, His blessings are not there. Zach? A hard thought for me, at least, is in this idea of 
what won't be happening, the, the sorrow, the pain, the regret, the guilt, extends to the thought of the people who will not have made it. We can't leave room for, oh, I'm so sad over so, so and so. We, we have that. Now, here on earth, we, as God does, we, we wish that no one, including ourselves, yes, but other people will experience that eternal consequence. But when we get to heaven, that same feeling will also not exist because none of the first four describes that. And that's, it's hard to, at least for me to wrap my head around that. How can I be up there living it up in heaven, so to speak, in God's presence and that pure bliss? Do I have a knowledge of the people who aren't there? Is Let that, me help. Is that safe for me? Or, yeah. Yeah. Here, here's, here's how I think of it. Have you ever had those times, those moments, occasions in life where the joy is just so overwhelming that your troubles just fade? They just go, like the birth of a child, there's such great joy there that it's like everything else just, it's gone. It just fades so far back in your head you don't even think, you might not think about it for a few days. Troubles at work or repairs at home or, you know, my, my knee's been bothering me. You just, it's just gone. And I kind of picture being in heaven, in the presence of God, that it's just so overwhelming and joyful that all of that just is pushed out of our head where it, it doesn't even come to the conscious thought, if you will. So that's one. The other one is God's going to take care of it. I don't know how. <laughs> I don't know how, but He will. Mike. I'll go with the latter. You know, He'll take care of us somehow. But you know, we're also told that you know, whenever Jesus said, You must love me, that you're love for me has to extend to the point that uh, you have to almost hate your family. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying hate your family. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is that love for him has to be greater than the love that you have with, um, or even those that we have around you that you actually see. Right. Uh, so, Planet? I'm reminded of this conversation with the rich man of Lazarus in Luke 16. Who has the problem? The rich man. He's the one who's saying, I need to talk to my brothers. I need a dip of Lazarus' finger. We have no mention of Lazarus at all. He's good. Yeah, he was, he was received by Abraham. Yeah. That's it. And Abraham says, now he is at peace or he is at rest. Right. You're tormented, but he's good. Yeah. The yeah. trouble is with the rich man. The trouble mm -hmm. is the regret that he has. And all the torture, the suffering, the pain. And I think that speaks volumes that there's silence with the Lazarus after he's received peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, let's read now. Um, let's read nine. I, I really want to grab the biggest chunk of this. So let's read nine through 21. We'll break it down though. Uh, let's go 9 through 15, then 16 to 21. Who will get 9 through 15 for us? Philip. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her life was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great high wall with twelve gates, and the twelve angels, the twelve angels at the, twelve angels at the gates, and the names written on the names, which were the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations. And on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he talked with me at a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. <laughs> and 16 through 21, sorry. Clint. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measures its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. 
The wall is built of jasper, but the city was pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth jasper, and the twelfth gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of single pearl, and the city and the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. Okay. So what's the overall vision here conveying to us? More fantastic than Okay, yeah. Something more fantastic than really human words are adequate to describe, but I mean he's using these things to to make an impression of the beauty and the glory of heaven. And so he talks about the exterior here, first of all, and later in the chapter he starts talking about the interior. But the bride is talking about the city, again, the symbolic language there. And it says in verse 11 in particular that it was like a stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Does everyone know what jasper is? It's a diamond. It's diamond. So think of a diamond, and he's saying that's that's what it looks like. Um, I mean, diamond, even in our culture, is, is a symbol of beauty, a symbol of wealth. It's generally the stone that is given for engagement to say, you know, I'm, I'm making a commitment. I, I want to marry you, enter into a lifelong covenant with you. And so diamond um, has carries that meaning with us, and he's giving it... This idea, you know, the glory of God, her light was like the most precious stone, like jasper, like a big diamond, if you will. Um, Mike, do you have something? Okay. Uh, what about the wall? Verse 12. How does it describe it? Okay, great and high. We're going to get into exactly how great and high in just a minute but it says in this great and high wall it's got these 12 gates uh, 12 angels at the gates and the names written on them what's written on the gates in verse 12 okay why would it have the names of the tribes of Israel what what significance would there be to that the tribes of Israel were God's people Okay. I'm sorry, what was that? Inside heaven, now you will have God's people again. Okay. Well, also, the children of Israel were the lineage through which Christ would enter the world. That was an entry through their lineage, chosen and selected separate. Right, through them came, came the Redeemer, came, came the one who opened the gates of heaven. To all of mankind. Um, so very good. And verse 14 then. What about the 12 foundations? The apostles. Why would they be? Their names show on the foundations. Because they were administers of the word of God. The Holy Spirit revealed to them. And then they laid forth the word of truth for us. Yeah, Paul, Paul describes it, the foundation of the apostles and prophets. That's what the church was built on, this foundation of the apostles and prophets. And so they had an integral part to undergirding all of that. Um, now it says 12 foundations. I was talking to Ron the other day, and Ron, you, you interrupt me if I get something wrong here. But they've got machines where he works that are like, some of the parts are like the size of a truck, Right? And they have to be on the isolation pads because any shift in the earth, you know, whether that's through, I suppose it could be heating, cooling, moisture, less moisture, um, could be through earthquakes, tremors, things like that. They can't have those machines, you know, jostle because it'll throw them out of balance and be a problem. So there, I don't know what these isolation pads looks like, but I imagine they're 
uh, incredible to see with how they've been built and constructed and very solid underneath that machine who, do you have any idea what the machine weighs? I think it's about 10 tons. Okay, 10 tons. Okay, you think about that. Well, similarly, it's talking about these 12 foundations. And if you know anything about buildings, you know anything about that, that this is saying this foundation is so solid, there's nothing that could possibly shake it. Nothing that could possibly move it out of place or cause it to collapse at some point. You know, if the foundation is not right, then a building will collapse. And so this foundation is solid, it is sure. There's nothing that's going to happen to this city. Any other thoughts there? So how about the measurement of this city? What's the measurement here? Square. And a square is perfect. Okay, square? Yes. Square is perfect. Any other thoughts? What, what does it say here? Now, in the New King James, it has 12,000 furlongs. What was it in the ESV? Stadia. Stadia. Okay. What, what is that in our language? <laughs> okay, 1,380 miles. Anybody have a different one? I had a little different one. Huh? Yeah, 1,500 miles. Um, I think it maybe depends on which period in history, like a cubit at times would vary between nations and peoples and centuries and stuff. But about 1,500 miles. Anybody know what's about 1,500 miles from where we are right now? Texas. Um, it would be El Paso. If you know anything about Texas, El Paso is like in the very far tip west of Texas. I, I looked at the map. It is from here, Newton, North Carolina, to the other side of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Or it almost reaches, if you stretch that line up, it almost reaches the border of Colorado and Utah. It gets you up into Montana. If you take it northeast, it goes into Newfoundland, way up in Canada, right? So you think about that 1,500 miles. What, what's the picture being given here? This is a city. <laughs> yeah, it's massive. This, I, I would venture to say that if this city actually existed on earth, all of humanity could live within it. You know, we think, but we've, people spread all over the world. But you look how much empty space there actually is in this world. There's tons of empty space. You just drive along the highways, you drive between cities, and there is just massive amounts of fields and forests and things where there's zero development. If you had a 1,500 mile by 1,500 mile city, and you put people in there orderly, I'm guessing, now if somebody wants to argue that, say, no, we could, we could only put, okay. Still a lot of people, right? Six billion, seven billion, how many ever? Philip then Zach. Should we be taking this literally though? I mean, this whole book is been... No, 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 that's not my point. Okay. That's not my point. Because uh, 12, I mean, typically the 12 and the 10 is just like a completeness or a whole Yes. Yes, my apologies. I'm not meaning to say literal here. I'm just trying to emphasize the enormity of it. And is that? This reminds me of the song, <coughs> There is Room in the Kingdom. Again, not because it's bound by some physical perimeter, but it, it's more than 1,200 whatever. You know, it's, it's bigger than any number. It's bigger than any tape measure or wherever gold reed can measure. It's it's immense, it's, it has no boundary. Yeah, the thing, the thing he's conveying here is it's big enough for all the redeemed of all time. It's more than sufficient for all of God's people to be there, to dwell there, and to dwell there comfortably. Exactly. It's not that it has to be big, it's God's there. 
I mean, his his presence is unlimited as well. Right. So there's we can't even we can't fathom the concept of how big it is because we can't fathom how God, how big God's presence is because He's not bound by time and space either. Right. Yeah, I think you know what Paul said at the very beginning was that. John is really struggling with how to find the words to even describe what he's seeing. And um, the enormity of this, you can tell he's, he's struggling with it. Well, well and he's, he's being, um, he's seeing this here. And it's an amazing picture when you, when you go back to verse 9. It, it talks about that, you know, one of these seven angels, he came to me. And it says in verse 10, He carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me this great city. Um, one writer said this, this is like Moses going up onto Pisgah and overlooking into the promised land. That's what's happening with John here. He's overlooking into that promised land. And he, again, is trying to put it into words with which we are familiar. I mean, you, you, there's no way heaven could be described to us in heavenly terms and what it actually is. We don't have a concept of that realm. We, we live in this physical realm and so he's putting it in these physical terms but it, again on the size of this city you have it square you know 1500 miles by 1500 miles but then what else does it say? It's not just the length and width the height of that wall is 1,500 miles. That, that's just baffling. Because when you think about some of the upper echelon of aircraft flight is 80,000 with some military aircraft, 80,000 feet is about how many miles? Who, who's the math genius? Okay. 5280? 16 miles. This is almost 10 times, no, I'm sorry, 100 times further, right? 1,500 miles high. Again, just the, the enormity of that. If, if we were to walk into something like that, we would be overawed looking at that wall and the gates are in that wall and being able to see those found the foundation under how that foundation is decorated with all those beautiful jewels on it. it it would just it would flood our senses to where we would be stunned in looking at it 8,000 is 15.15 miles okay 15.15 perfect right 100 times beyond that so we're talking way out into outer space so again to Philip's point you know, some people try to say, well, that new Jerusalem's going to be here. No, <laughs> it's, it's not going to be built here on earth. It just, it, 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 it can't fit. It, it literally cannot fit on earth, not even in the atmosphere of the earth. And so it's just giving us that overwhelming size and strength of it. It talks about the thickness of the wall down in verse 17. You know, then he measured its wall, 144 cubits. And what that's talking about is how thick that wall is. Um, it's over 200 feet thick. So there's nothing that's going to shake or, or take that wall down. It's impossible. All right. Um, let's read 22 to 27, please. Who will read that? Ron. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall be no means entered in, excuse me, in, enter it 
anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Okay. So, it says they, there is no temple in it. And the second question I ask is, has, how has the relationship of God, man, and the temple changed? What was it in the Old Testament? Well, it was a physical building. It had divisions in it. They didn't have full access to God. And only those who were once a year. So, to me, it, it's nothing physical. There are no separation any longer. Um, and the temple was earthly, and this is spiritual heavenly. Mm -hmm. Jack? I would suggest that there's not going to be any hobbies in heaven. It's all praise, it's all worship, because that's what the temple represented. God's there, we go there to make sacrifice, which will be sacrifice and then sin sacrifice in heaven. There's not going to be that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's all praise, all worship. Right. It, Clint? There's, there's no representation of anything. The tabernacle is a representation of God with Israel as they want. The temple was fixed. God representatively existing in heaven. There is no representation needed. We are with God. He is the temple. Yeah, He is the temple. And back to Zach's point a while ago, He fills this massive city. And so you're there. You're in God's presence. You're in direct fellowship with God and with the Lamb. And it said it had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it. The glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. They're the source of light. They are light in and of themselves. Um, and then it talks about these nations who are there, including kings of the earth. They come and bring their glory and honor to Him. The gates are not going to be shut at all by day. There's no threat to heaven. It is massive, it is, uh, but there's no threat there. They bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. In verse 27, he reminds his readers, remember in those letters to the churches, there were multiple ones that warned them. And in this chapter, in 21 verse 8, and then in verse 27 again, <clears throat> he reminds them, those who had Jezebel among them, those who were committing sexual immorality, those who were fearful of the persecution and the enemy and on the verge of compromise, he warns them, don't do it because you will not end up in this great and glorious place. Now, with the few seconds we have left, um, how many of you have heard of some place of beauty in a far off place and you've decided we're going to go there? Right here on earth. All right, it might be Yellowstone. Like, I've heard Yellowstone is gorgeous, it's wonderful, it's beautiful. And you can look at pictures. Big deal. You get there, it's completely different. Right? But we do that. We plan for it, we save for it. We make that sacrifice, we put in the effort to pack everything up, get in a vehicle or you know, get on a plane. We go there, we stay there, we explore it, we look at it, we soak it up, we enjoy it, right? Well, here is heaven. The picture of heaven is being drawn for us. We, we need to put our sights, our focus. This is where I want to go. I want to be here. Whatever I need to do, I'm going to get there. So whatever planning needs to be put in place, whatever sacrifice, whatever investment, you know, me investing in that, that's where I want to be. And when we get there, this description right here is going to be nothing. Just like looking at a picture, if you're looking at a picture of Old Faithful or, you know, if you've been to the Grand Tetons or anything like that, or the Grand Canyon, anything like that, that picture is does not do it justice in any way. But standing there, you feel it. And when we get to heaven, 
it's going to be just like that compared to what we have written here. All right, any other thoughts? All right, we'll wrap it up there. Lord willing, Revelation 22 next week.